Hi, I'm Ray Vada at South by Southwest with Cal Penn. How are you doing, Cal? Good, how are you? I'm good. So you are here promoting your new show with National Geographic Channel. Correct? Yes. How did you get involved with National Geographic Channel to do a show? Um, so I uh, got in touch with them probably about a year and a half ago. They reached out. You know, They had the concept for a show roughly based on big data, um, mm -hmm. and they were looking for a host and, and co-producer for the show. And I had just come off of a show I was doing for Discovery Channel that was um, sort of like Top Chef for engineers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, I think they were looking for a host who had sort of a public-private combined background. So mostly yeah. I'm an actor. I took a two-year sabbatical and, and worked in D.C. Um, at the White House. And, and so I think they uh, ideally wanted somebody who had a little bit of familiarity with the concept of big data, um, but really didn't have any intimate experience to it. So as we developed the show and realized we wanted to take these big data concepts and then find human interest stories within them to explore in sort of a documentary style, um, it seemed like a nice fit since my background is in film. So the documentary aspects of that help. Um, yeah. yeah. How did how much big data background did you have coming into it? Like, were you the kind of person who was reading a lot of articles about it at the time, or had done any work with it? Or? Yeah, I was reading articles about big data and and, uh, and was really fascinated by it. There was also you know uh, a lot of information about how open source data was being used to track things like um, you know government expenditure, uh, you know even per patient or per individual or per citizen. Um, so there were kind of the, those big picture elements to it. No pun intended. Yeah. That's the title of our show. Uh, but then having the chance to do those deep dives on the human interest stories um, were really my, my bigger exposure to it. Um, and then as we started developing the series, actually, when we, when we got to the point where we were putting together the individual episodes, um, right around that time there were, was a lot of news narrative about things like uh, the NSA and there was a lot, of, you know, a lot of chatter on Twitter about things like privacy. Um, we all thought that that was particularly interesting because it, it seemed to paint a more nefarious picture of things like big data than, mm -hmm. um, than a more, what we thought was a more complete picture. So certainly those are stories that we should explore and look at. Um, I felt like that makes fantastic cable news more than it makes reality. So when we all check in on Facebook or you download iTunes and you click yes to the user agreement, you're not reading all 54 or whatever pages yeah. it is. Um, but we all are agreeing that these big companies can capture our data, sell the data, process it, figure out how to market to us. You know, you're on Facebook sometimes and you see an ad for exactly the type of product you just looked for. Exactly. And it freaks a lot of people out. But we thought instead of the nefarious stories that were out there in, in the news world, why not look at the actual broader picture of what big data means and how we interact with it? So in the show, we decided to look at things like drugs, sex, crime, money, um, food, and what those pat what the patterns in that um, are, what, what patterns in that are available to us because of, of open source big data, and how can we make interesting stories based on that? What were some? I watched the drug episode so far. What are some of the more interesting things that came out to you that you didn't real, or you didn't have any clue we were surprised by? There were a lot of things. So some of the some of the more kind of lighthearted, jovial things were things like you know who consumes the most pizza in the United States. It's actually not New Yorkers nor right. Chicagoans. It's uh, Orlando, Florida, um, and uh, <laughs> you know, things like tourists. Things like um, you know the the um, quickest way to produce protein with the least amount of resource, uh, animal protein, is actually grasshoppers. And grasshoppers are eaten in plenty of places around the world, not traditionally in the United States, but it was an interesting way to look at the concept of food. Um, we sent a crew down to Mexico to, uh, to spend some time with a family that actually you know, catches and harvests and cooks and sells grasshoppers. Yeah. Uh, and then there are the things that, that um, you know, are, are a little more newsy than human interest -y. So things like uh, drug addiction. It turns out Vermont has the highest drug addiction rate. That was really surprising to um, me when right. I watched the episode. I was yeah. like, I would not have guessed Vermont. Vermont seems very like hippie and peaceful, yeah. and they wouldn't think that they were, had such a drug situation going on there. Exactly. I wouldn't have thought that either. And to, to, you know, to see the, the big data aspect of it and then realize why, and the reason why has everything to do with age, uh, three major highways that intersect, basically connecting New York, Boston, and Montreal that go through uh, Vermont, um, you know, percentage of old people that make prescription drugs more available to young people. Um, a lot of them are selling it on the side. There's a whole, yeah. you know, amalgam of things that are happening at the same time that, that allow that drug statistic to take place. So there were things like that, too, that were deeply fascinating to a lot of us. Do you have any examples of, like, your own life intersecting with that big data, like, things that you're like, oh, this makes sense. I can see myself as an example of a data point that I... Yeah, I mean, the pizza was the biggest shocker. I grew up in New Jersey and I live in New York. So, yeah. you know, in terms of who prides themselves on good pizza, it's us. 
Yeah. Uh, so there, there was something like that. But then there are, there are also patterns on, you know, I, I always thought it was interesting. One of my favorite segments we had the chance to do was going down to Florida. Um, there was an uptick in STDs, uh, which then yielded a, a huge uptick in sexual activity. It turned out to be in a senior citizens community. Um, and one of the reasons was that they didn't, uh, you know, they, they were born and raised way before sex ed in school. And they're in their 80s and 90s. They're not worried about pregnancy anymore. Yeah. Um, and so there's a spike in STDs there. Now, I thought that was particularly interesting because there are so many conversations, uh, I think, relatively archaic about whether we should have things like sex ed in schools. Um, I think we should. A lot of our yeah. friends on the right don't agree with us. But um, but that's an, it's an ongoing conversation, right? And it, it comes up every time there's an election. It comes up every time somebody says something crazy on TV. Uh, and then here was a not crazy set of data points that focus on something entirely separate, but having to do with STDs, the lack of awareness, lack of information in a community that um, is having an increasing amount of sex that you never would have thought. And then you do sex ed in like retirement homes as well. Well, so this is the thing, right? Homes, right? In terms of how it interacts with our lives, whether you've served in government or whether you're a teacher or whether you're a kid who grew up with sex ed, seeing, ironically, someone of our grandparents' generation who never grew up with that and therefore are getting STDs unlike your 16-year-old cousin, it's interesting. It yeah. kind of stops to make you think, okay, this actually affects me because it affects my community. Yeah. Now that you're out of government, is it hard having all this big data information coming to you and being like, I want to go fix this right now. I want to like make take action with this right now. No, you know, I think the nice thing about working with Nat Geo was it, it's the, the data that sets that we explore are not about uh, government or politics or, or anything. They're actually uh, that human interest element to it that I keep talking about or yeah. the, the aspect of universality was important to us. Um, and the Nat Geo brand didn't really want to do anything judgmental either, which I appreciated. So even the sex episode, the food episode, the grasshopper thing, right? Yeah. Um, we wanted to not, you know, there are plenty of shows out there that I think do a great job at the, the look at what weird people are eating or look at the weird dishes or look at the craziness yeah. in the world. And we actually wanted to take a, a different angle to it and say, what are these, okay, maybe insane, but sort of beautiful things that connect us or that make us different um, in sex, crime, drugs, food, you know, all of the above. Uh, and so it had less to do with any of the government stuff, yeah. even though there was a little bit of insight just based on the big data concept itself, um, and much more deep dive into the human aspect of it. Who do you see as like the ideal viewer? Who do you pitch this as like who's going to watch this show and really, really enjoy it? I think it's broad. At first I thought it, it may be more college students or mm -hmm. younger viewers, but then as we've been marketing and doing some, you know, screenings and, and the panel that we had here at South by Southwest, it seems like it's, it's actually a really nice cross-section of people. Uh, the age demographic for our panel that we just had seemed to be really wide. Yeah. Uh, that was exciting. I, th I think um, since it's the type of show that we've aimed to, to be both educational and entertaining yeah. um, with a, uh, and a more uplifting spin, I'm, I'm hoping that means that our, our audience is, is broad. How was your panel today that you did? It was good. It was a lot of fun. I, you can't, yeah. I'm biased. I was on the panel. <laughs> on the panel so you, so you yeah. thought it was good. <laughs> did, it was good. did they come yeah. in with any really interesting questions you hadn't thought of? Uh, the audience coming back at you with ideas or questions that you guys hadn't addressed or could maybe make another uh, another episode based on things that people brought up? Yeah, you know, a trend that I thought was particularly interesting with a couple of the questions in the discussion after our presentation, um, a lot of folks asked things like, uh, what did you do if you had trouble finding the data sets to go with the stories. So the perception there, and I think this comes from the way we consume yeah. our mass media, the perception was we picked the story before we had data. And actually the opposite was true. We had these data sets that, we, you know, pages and pages, and from that we decided what we were actually gonna do um, for our segments. And so even just the thought process of, of how data analytics worked, which is not something I was an expert on before. I mean, I'm not an expert on it now either, but yeah. uh, but how that works and how that piece, pieces together was, um, was insightful, I thought. So what's next? Are you going to do another season of this? Are you going to let this go out first and then see what happens? Or? I mean, if uh, the network decides to do another season, I would love to. Yeah. I think now it's up to the viewer. You know, I, I'm, I'm very hopeful. I think um, there's been a lot of great uh, buzz generated. I, I, uh, I have a couple of projects coming out or, or out now, and this is the one that I get asked about the most. Um, oh, that's great. Which is very exciting. Uh, yeah. So I'm hoping that, I mean, I could, I would love to do this for 10 years, you know, to have the chance to go out and, and be part of these great creative segments around the world and, and learn a lot. Um, I think it's particularly interesting because over the next 10 years, the projection is that the concept of big data or, or uh, easily accessible information, open source data is going to be changing and, and uh, you know, adapting to what people are doing. So um, I feel like the show can change and adapt with it. Yeah. I mean, the one question we're asking everybody, is this your first South by Southwest? You've been coming No, I, I, we came a couple times. You know, we premiered the second Harold and Kumar film, Harold okay. and Kumar Escape from Guantanamo Bay here. Um, and uh, that was fun and totally different than coming here for National Geographic. <laughs> I love that I can learn about 
both sides of South by yeah you know that was more of the big stoner film premiere where nobody was sober around you at all <laughs> uh, and around this is like everybody's it. sober everyone's here for you know it's, it's an educational program um, but I lo always love coming down here Austin is a really fun city and especially coming for the festival you get to meet a lot of fun people